Around two years ago, I made a video covering the beta maps of Super Mario 64 that were discovered in the July 2020 Giga Leak. While those were thoroughly looked at, I only glossed over the differences of the existing maps to their beta counterpart. But there was so much more to these maps that were never discussed, from the different layout of Lethal Lava Land to Cool Cool Mountain being practically a whole other level, and so much more intricate differences. So today on Cut Content, we'll not just be looking closely at these beta versions of existing levels, but also taking one more look at the cut maps of Super Mario 64. Back in 1995, the Nintendo 64 was set to be revealed at the upcoming Shoshinkai event in December. But a month prior to that, Nintendo went ahead and patented their console to ensure rightful ownership. But within that very patent came with black and white screenshots of Super Mario 64. These were specifically of the exterior of Princess Peach's castle. The most obvious difference is the presence of what may be a clock in place of Peach's mural. This also appeared in the Shoshinkai and the early 1996 builds of the game. But another big difference comes just in front of that with the bridge. Being quite simple back then, made from the same brick material as the castle with stone pillars at front and curved considerably. In the Shoshinkai and 96 builds, guardrails were added and the stone pillars were removed, before becoming what we have in the final game. Other differences include overall simpler brick textures in both builds, a lot of missing details around the front yard such as no wooden fences around the moat in both builds, and literally no real object in the patent build. Also, no metal doors found in the moat either that would lead into the basement, and a large cloud was hovering around the castle's tower, which was gone by the next build. But the biggest difference is that there was a clear pathway that went behind the castle. As we know, the castle in the final game is up against a mountain. In this case, the mountains were further back, giving us room. While we can't see the back, I wouldn't be surprised if the courtyard that is full of booze was originally intended to be accessed this way. With that, we move on to the Shoshinkai build of the maps, thus moving us into the castle. Here, we have a very different looking interior, not only having two platforms to the second floor as opposed to stairs, but also textures that were very different, having more of a night sky appearance with this moon, as opposed to the blue sky and clouds. As well, the doors are different with white numbers as opposed to red over the stars. But going further in, the level placements were also different, Likely not finalized at this point, but you had Cool Cool Mountain on the left as opposed to Bawam Battlefield, Lethal Lava Land in place of Womp's Fortress, Womp's Fortress in place of Cool Cool Mountain, and Dire Dire Docks on the far right in place of Jolly Roger Bay. The central door at the top led to Bowser in the Dark World. Portraits were also different for Womp's Fortress and Cool Cool Mountain at that. The door to the hall leading to the courtyard was here which was still unfinished, and may even have been in a transitional period from its outdoor days. It also had rather rough looking bricks at that time, and the skybox was black. But at this point, no other floors did exist, which would explain why the metal door in the moat didn't exist just yet. By 1996, the design did start to evolve to look similar to the final games, except the stairs still were just two platforms. However, there is one other map I want to toss your way. A cut map. The way this is laid out and designed looks like something that would fit in the theme with the castle interior. In fact, the level's name, Donjon, literally translates to Great Tower or Castle. It's possible that this area was being designed as the upper floor of this castle, considering the name's translation to Great Tower. Or it might even be an earlier build of the hub area, potentially for the patent build. The area is full of random textures, slopes, and high ceilings. There are no portraits, but I theorize that maybe the walls themselves might have been what was meant to be used instead. For example, there is a clear painting here, but on a wall. Maybe one was to jump into that originally to access the level. Otherwise, moving on to actual levels themselves, we'll start with Womp's Fortress, which back in 1995 was simply called Mountain. From the get-go, the textures are quite different, using both rougher looking textures, bricks, and these bubble looking textures. As well, both Thwomps and Womps had a rather different face. By 1996, the levels start to resemble the final games with only some irregularities, such as the missing islands, 
a different placement of the pole, and as well these triangle platforms on the tower, which are in fact still in the data of the game. Lethal Lava Land is next, or as it was known back then, Fire Bubble. It had a rather different layout, missing a lot of its platforms. In fact, right off the bat amongst the changes, the starting path begins on the right side, as opposed to the left. Next, the spinning bars had three rows, instead of the easier two from the final game. As well, the bullies back then only had one spike on their head, rather than horns. And apparently, the old 2D enemy Blark was set to appear here too, but never was finished to appear. On to Cool Cool Mountain back then called Snow Slider. While it can be a bit tough to get a true grasp of the level design from the available footage, what can be seen is radically different. First we have the area where you meet the mother penguin, which by the way was clearly starved back then, and her child that Mario is about to yeet. The background shows us the step pyramid like structure, and to the left, a whole brick area. Looking almost like a fortress as opposed to the simple mountain of the final game. No ski lift, no cabin, the other footage is the top area, which also lacked the cabin, but still had the child penguin. From here, Mario can slide down as usual, but the slide is very different too, which shows more of that fortress-like design of the mountain. On top of that, the interior slide was completely different. It was literally the one that was later repurposed for Tall Tall Mountain, which while similar, had a part that would let you section off from the main path. By 1996, while much started to resemble the final game, the penguin in the race was much taller, likely scaled down later to make him less of an obstacle for Mario. Then comes Waterland, which became Dire Dire Docks in the final game. While textures were as usual different, it did have a number of other major differences, such as the lack of a whirlpool at the beginning. The other detail are these water mines that resided in the tunnel, resembling the same mines that Mario would throw Bowser into. If Mario bumped into them, they would blow up. Still in the final game's data too at that. And of course Bowser Submarine used art from Super Mario Bros. 3 here instead, and had the word Koopa on it, which was scrubbed out by the final game, probably cause we stopped calling him that over in the west by then. Jolly Roger Bay did also appear to exist in the 95 build too, which all we have is the sunken ship to see. It was a simpler design, and modeled differently with it even having a mast. The water was also very foggy, so much so that we can't see details beyond that. Circling back to the courtyard for a third time, it's time for the ghost house, known later as Big Boo's Haunt. The earliest screenshots had very limited sections visible, a room with a carpet featuring booze, and this room full of Mr. Eyes. Good luck trying to get a blue coin out of each of these without getting hit. By 96, we start to see more of the mansion, which mostly resembled the final games. A notable change is the top floor featuring a painting of the yellow scaring boo, as opposed to the final game's blue shy boo. But a major element was also planned for this level. Keys. Keys were planned to be used in the mansion and came in a variety of colors, all of which appear to be held by Boos, which upon defeat can be collected. Likely one was supposed to unlock doors in the mansion in at least our first run of it. I imagine they may have been removed for making the level overly complicated in what was already a more complex level. Originally called Koopa 1, which shows how temporary this whole castle area was, Bowser in the Dark World originally only led to the arena you fight Bowser in. Possibly the level wasn't done yet, or there were no levels initially planned for these fights. Also, no cutscene was ready for Bowser when you entered the fight back then. The later builds introduced the level, which was mostly the same. Very few differences, such as the lack of a purple switch in front of the flamethrower near the beginning, and a few different placements of objects, from red coins, to Goombas, and a what up mushroom. Now before moving past the 1995 build, there is one more level worth mentioning, an entire cut level. Resembling what is a massive fortress, and even partially seen in early footage, it was leaked to the public and we now have full access to the level. The level is rather massive and very incomplete, as there is no real way to scale the fortress. It's full of slopes and platforms, but clearly, additional platforms such as floating ones or blocks are needed to venture higher. There is also an area with water which is textureless, but that is because it used an outdated version of the water system at that point. At the very top is a blue platform. This was to hold an obvious star to collect, which by the way, stars early on were 2D, as opposed to the full 3D models of the final game. The same star can later be found in the game's start menu, but in silver. And if you've been enjoying this video, 
give it a like and subscribe to support us and keep creating new videos. Eventually by 1996, the game had moved forward quite a bit, which already as seen with some of the evolutions of the stages shown, it's quite evident. At this point is when we see the iconic stage, Babam Battlefield. While it generally does resemble the final games, one major aspect seen in the distance is a major spike at the top. Might have been in place of the flagpole from the final game, but it was quite large as seen when fighting King Babam. It's likely where Koopa the Quick would point you for the race. Speaking of which, Koopa the Quick originally walked around more like a regular Koopa, rather than being stationary like in the final game. The other major difference comes in the placement of the floating island, which was much higher up and above the chain chomp, likely moved to make it easier to fly to. But aside from these, there are many little differences, and it mostly comes down to placement of various objects, or lack thereof, coins, NPCs, and fences. On to Hazy Maze Cave, which had a few differences here and there. Right off the bat, the maps that showed your location were missing, which could definitely make it harder in this maze. The Scuttlebugs also had a different design, looking a lot angrier and without their tie-dye bodies. As well, the lift platforms had a simpler design. The Metal Cap Room also had grittier textures, which I think fits the theme of the Metal Cap so much more. However, an interesting bit is that the boulders that would normally damage Mario were intended to break up part originally. The chunks of broken boulders are found in the data of the game in fact, and did eventually make it into Super Mario 64 DS for when Wario smashes right into them. Shifting Sandland had a number of small differences, such as the usual missing or different locations for various objects, such as the pillar being slightly closer to the pyramid. The odd one is the big toy box, which normally followed the pathway on top of the quicksand, but apparently it could go off rails at one point. Imagine randomly encountering that while walking in the sand. Also interesting is that the top of the pyramid wasn't so pyramid-like, and almost looked like a house instead. Possibly how you originally could enter from the top. Though later when the final top of the pyramid was added, there was going to be a cutscene for when it blew up before it was removed. My favorite is the derpy look on this Pokey's face, a complete contrast to its look in the final game. Meanwhile indoors, the Grindle had a slightly different face texture, and the Irox eye looked a bit different too. With development getting closer to the end, by the time the next few stages were shown for the first time, most were already pretty similar to their final design, which brings us to Tall Tall Mountain. As per tradition, it has some objects missing or arranged differently, such as the missing fly guy as well as the platform holding the rolling log being flat as opposed to being sloped which could have made things easier here. Aside from these, the slide from the 1995 Cool Cool Mountain was finally introduced here, and the extra pathway it had was gone at this point. Jumping ahead to the ever-loved Rainbow Ride, while not too much can be seen in the screenshot, the section here does show that much of the background platforms were missing. Also the flamethrower here is of a different design. And kinda related, the Tower of the Wind Cap level lacked coins and also lacked the cloud objects too. TikTok clock barely had any differences, the only feasible one being that there is a yellow pole on the pendulum instead of the wooden one. Lastly, with Bowser in the sky, a few small changes existed including the Kronpa ball missing here, the lack of a fly guy by the rotating platforms, the red coin missing here, and also the arrows in the arrow path using a different design. What I wish wasn't cut was the final Bowser area being red. Being red looked a lot more menacing and could have really added to the final battle's mood in my opinion. Now while these were the differences in existing maps, save for those that were cut entirely, there were also a number of test maps too that were never meant to appear in the game, but we'll quickly explore those as a bonus. These being full of shapes and sizes to better measure Mario's physics with the environment. The first is one that is full of slides that come in various sizes to better test how far Mario can slide, including these stop blocks to test Mario's crashing motion. In the same level, there are a number of floors too that are color coded to sound different when Mario steps on them, a way to test how it would be to go from terrain to terrain. On top of that, a cannon is here too to test how far Mario can fly to the tall top of the level. In the second map, is just one big checkerboard and nothing more, possibly just a place for testing Mario's running and jumping abilities, one other theory being to see how this camera zooms out with both Mario and the cut Luigi on the same map, considering the size of the place. In the third one, it tests Mario's ability to walk on various terrains, such as sand, 
or moving along the ceiling as seen with the monkey bars in the final game. Also there is this hole in the middle that may test Mario falling into a pit and trying to get out. There is even a coin here that can't be collected and instead warps Mario to another part of the map. And the last level is this varied one that has floors with various elevations to test Mario's running and jumping at different heights. As well there is a block here too to test Mario's push mechanic. But all in all, while these test maps may seem simple and not very eventful, these levels were quite possibly put through the ringer in order to get Mario's physics to be what we know and love today. And so through a couple of years of development, the many levels of Super Mario 64 changed and evolved into the set that have grown memorable in our minds. Many of these are still rather fascinating with their intense differences, such as Cool Cool Mountain. But even then, the evolutions of these levels only made them more complex and interesting into what we got for the final game. While I would have absolutely loved to have seen the Big Fortress level, seeing and experiencing its existence at all after all these years made me ecstatic and inspired me to originally make the old beta maps video and once again return and make a much meatier video out of it. But while these were the maps of Super Mario 64 that we know of, there could still be more details and maps we never saw during the beta stage. And if any of these find their way into the wild, I'll definitely plan to cover them. So hit the subscribe button for I plan to be back with more Mario and other games cut content soon. Hit the like button and comment below on what beta map was your favorite. So everyone, thank you for watching.